Hi there. This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and very happy to be here tonight. I hope this is coming through clear to you. And I just got back last night, as, as a matter of fact, from the UK. I extended my stay a week in part to attend the incredible event of the summer solstice at Stonehenge, where over 20,000 people were in attendance which was amazing and and a wild synchronicity in my life because I had been at the Great Pyramid on the 21st of December 2012 and on the 21st of June last year I was in Shasta for the Venus Transit. So there was a perfect triangle being created uh, by my being in all three places, one right after the other, and I'm sure that that was a, a ley line synchronicity that somehow was uh, fulfilling some kind of uh, requirement for our planet at this time, which is, is, is really quite fascinating. So tonight my guest is Jeff Harvey, and he was actually on my show about a month ago, and we just didn't get to cover everything that there is to cover with Jeff. He's, he's got a lot of interesting things going on in, in his background and in his everyday life, so I wanted to have him back, and we decided to sort of revisit some of the things we briefly talked about and also go into some new areas. So I do want to welcome Jeff. Jeff, are you there? Yes, good to talk with you. Oh, excellent. Yeah, lovely to have you. And the other thing is just letting people know that there is a lot going on, as many people will know. Uh, I am aware of the, the NASA document that came out. What I'm not sure about is exactly whether that is everything everyone sort of thinks it is or whether they were just looking at some possible futures and and some people kind of like went off the deep end with it. Now, there is no doubt that they are or there are factions of NASA that do have diabolical or a part of the, you know, the dark side with diabolical plans, but it's it's all in how you look at it and I did look at the document that they referred to and I have to say that that particular document is talking about strategizing future events and what they think could be part of the future, there is no reason to think that uh, that actually they're wrong. In a sense, they're, they're actually kind of strategizing things that they know might be coming down and not necessarily creating them themselves. Uh, I think it is a cover agency and not necessarily those people working there are not always sort of part of the, the cabal, if you will although certainly some of the higher-ups may be. And other scientists may be being used, and, and that's a whole discussion in and of itself. One last announcement I do want to make here is that I am organizing a very interesting group of people to go to Malta, and I just got word today that we, we've got a most extraordinary list of speakers who are agreeing to come on board, it, it's looking like, and... Among those people are uh, John Anthony West and Graham Hancock, possibly Daniel Brinkley and, wow, um, Robert Schock and, and several others. I mean, the list is just pretty, pretty mind-blowing. And at this point, we're, we're actually looking to turn this into a, a television production. I'm not sure whether we'll open it up to the, to the public or not as far as bringing peop- allowing people to buy tickets to come along with us. Uh, but the list is growing every day, and it just seems to be something where the zeitgeist is being triggered, and there's a lot, you know, a lot going on. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there, that we really are getting an incredible group of speakers together. And as it happens, we are filming a documentary of the signs of Atlantis in Malta. I have been sent there by sort of what you might call a, a do- psychic download uh, a while ago, that said it was time to go there and and do this. Um, What I'm thinking is going to happen is that we are going to come across some information that has been stowed away on Malta prior to the fall of Atlantis, that Malta wasn't actually Atlantis per se, but that it was one of the outlying territories which had um, very special links to uh, sort of maybe secret societies on Atlantis during the day. And we are at a very critical juncture on this planet right now, and so this is why this whole thing is coming to the fore and why this is so crucial. 
but it is fascinating that we're getting the response we are and it, it looks like we may even be able to get some investors in, interested um some networks and so on so I just wanted to throw that out <laughs> Sorry, at the background, my cat has decided to become very vocal and say hello to everyone, so that's what he is doing. Oh, anyway, Jeff, so how are you tonight? And let's let's just sort of start down that road, and maybe you could give yourself a brief introduction. Sure, sure. I'd like to say hello to, my, hello to my background there. Basically, my background starts out, uh, well, back in 1958, a few years later. I had some very strange occurrences. And uh, who knows, there may have been some contact back then. But as early as five or six years old, there were some contact attempts being made um, in the period of time just before you fall asleep. And basically, I learned how to block those because at the time, I didn't know what they were. They scared me. And of course, you know, as a little kid, you're just looking for any way out. And many things had changed after that because I did a lot of um, mind over matter work with my dad and it triggered all kinds of things subconsciously. And then years later, I realized I was going to be an operative and I went into the Navy. But before I got assigned to my aircraft carrier, I was inducted into a watcher group that uh, was basically keeping an eye on the Jesuit New World Order and what was going on with them and what their plans were. And so I spent about six years in there and uh, learned a lot of different things, had my first out-of-body experience at the time. And similar to what uh, I think it was John Lear was talking about, uh, Mike Monagle had found out that when you follow a soul out to the moon, you get told to go back if you do it astrally. And the same thing happened to me, which, you know, I always thought that was a lot of bunk until it happened, and I became a believer, obviously. And then many years later, I got out of the service, even though I had kept that oath for life term. I kept working away at my task, looking into big corporations, what was going on with them, and investigating them. That's when I found out about the Verizon pornography connection and all those things. And so I spent some time with Ross Perot's old company, um, General Motors, uh, EDS, spent a little time with Verizon and learned about what they were doing. And sometime after that, during this period, I was working in telecommunications and I became deathly ill and uh, basically had a few weeks left to live and got myself healed using naturopathic methods. And after I got back to the point where I could walk again, I decided I needed to become a practitioner and learn this, and I moved forward, learning remote viewing, learning all kinds of modalities, low-frequency stimulation of various parts of the body, and it led me to what I do today, which is radionics and scalar wave research with holograms and time travel. So today... Most of my work still focuses on helping patients detox from whatever it is they've got for an issue, but now we're learning ways of doing it so fast and so smoothly that I think the entire face of this type of procedure is going to change in the next few years. Well, that's that's a great, very short summary of who you are and what you've been doing, and a number of things that you actually mentioned there were quite interesting. I guess before we go down at least the, the road in terms of holograms, because I did do a show, as, as many people will know, and if you don't know, then it's on live stream. And uh, I think I, I'm still going to be putting it on YouTube shortly as well. And the whole thing was an amazing discussion about holograms and this group that Stephen Kelly's gotten involved with with that also has to do with uh, the holograms and apparently Jeff is also involved with that now and so so we can go down that road a bit but prior to that you know Jeff we had talked about a number of things in terms of your background and remote viewing and the things that you had been a part of in your past that some of which is, seems a bit sketchy right? I agree <laughs> and and so you're still trying to sort of figure out who you really are and what, what you were really doing back then. Is that right? I want the whole story. I've only got pieces. Right. 
and and I think that that's you know I mean obviously many of us are are in the same position where we have some pieces of the puzzle we we have some ideas about who we are and what our background is but then there are areas that have you know that are hazy um, that have lots of questions and it's it's a complex puzzle right. My so, question is why are whole sections of memory missing and. You know, you would think that with a reasonably coherent brain, you'd have memories of certain segments within your life in a somewhat continuous flow. But I've got huge chunks that are missing. And it's only by using certain techniques that I've been able to trigger some of those and bring them back. So, yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We need to get all of the answers. In terms of your use of radionics, do you want to talk about how you sort of stumbled in that direction a little more in a little more detail and what you have been doing with it sure I started out um, as a practitioner working in detox and I kept getting clients coming to me and saying you know you've got a science background your ex intelligence uh, what do you know about radionics I know you guys play with that and unfortunately that wasn't something that I was playing with at the time I'd heard about it I hadn't looked into it deeply enough because I was involved in low-frequency modalities, which I find out later is part of radionics. But basically, what happened was is I, I finally got enough requests to look into it that I started looking around the world at what systems were out there, who made them, and what countries. And I had to sort through them to make a decision on what I was going to get to start doing my research so I could advise clients. And I looked at all the systems from about 40 countries, and I came up with two. One is the SE5-1000 from Don Paris. And I contacted Don, and I said, look, you know, I'd be interested in selling your devices on my site to my clients. And he gave me the terms, and we went over it. And I said, okay, I'm going to start with a different system right now to get started. And once I've got a few of those sold and I learn the systems and got it under my belt, I'll take a look at yours because yours has a lot more sophistication and a database. So I got into it reasonably deep with them. We went over algorithms and how they do what they do, and I got a reasonable understanding. However, there was a whole lot that I didn't have time to look into with them because I had made my decision to go with Carl Wells's units, which I did. And I learned the use of organite, how to move those fields with the mind, how they work with the body and how low in frequency you can go and how you can affect the subconscious and use it for actually changing uh, matter and situation, events, and people affecting them directly. And so recently, about a couple of weeks ago, I was talking with Jerry Avalos about what he was doing with it and we were discussing how to program holograms and I said well it's probably you know some kind of radionics device and I looked into it and I went back to the manufacturer and I asked a little more detail and sure enough that's exactly the same technology that's used by all the major companies to do what we do in wellness by using holograms and scalar waves to transmit this so radionics encompasses not only the use of organite, but scalar waves as well. And lo and behold, obviously, I realized I still had my dealership and I just hadn't activated it. So I went back to Don and I activated it. And um, Jerry has decided to go into this whole hog with Hollow Tree. And he's a very anomalous individual. He's very gifted in many ways. And I think he decided to go off and do this separately uh, with a machine that I provided because he believes and I believe he can move this forward in a way that no one else has before because of his unique background with the chair and some other things. So I think radionics is being used in so many industries right now and we don't know about it. There's six major players out there and it's a huge industry and you can literally take substances, you can imprint them with different fields of information, because as we know, there's a field of information around every cell in your body, every molecule and every stone, piece of dirt and tree. And what we do is we measure 
many, many different algorithms in those information fields. We can see how vital it is, what kind of balance there is. We can even rebalance them. We can even take one substance and deliver the information field of another substance to it and cause it to act that way. And just like with vehicle emissions, you can destroy carcinogenic substances and all kinds of things so that they're no longer harmful, as well as deliver great substances into the body via the information field itself. Did you happen to see my interview with Pete Peterson? Yes, and I loved it. Okay, because he, you know, he talks a lot about the information field, and uh, I guess to some degree, it, it seemed at least at that time, and I'm not sure if it's true today, and maybe you can speak on this, but that he was talking about the fact that in in black projects they refer to this thing that I think of as called ether as the information field. And that that terminology is used widely used in in you know black projects, but that I get the impression that in in mainstream science they might not even know what you meant if you said that. I know, and that's one of the reasons that I'll be doing radio shows for the next year to educate the public <laughs> on exactly how it works because there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation out there, and since I know exactly how it works. Um, there's no reason that every person out there shouldn't, because once they realize what it can do, they're going to demand that it's out there. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, and and that mainstream science starts picking up the ball here and continuing to investigate, rather than just rejecting things out of hand that for whatever reason they're they're not feeling it has any merit. So, how did you get? I mean. Let me say that I didn't see in your background a real basis in science, per se. I thought you came from the more technical side of things when you were hired by the, by the sort of, I don't know what you call it, secret government or whatever. Well, my background started um, in high school learning physics, basic physics and electronics. Then I went into the Navy and I had basic electricity and electronics training which in those days encompassed some very low-frequency field information, hysteresis curves and things of that nature. It wasn't just connect the positive to the negative and the electrons will flow. We knew things down to a subatomic level. And then I went into closed-circuit television school. And after that, that's when my education really began. I mean, those were all the basics, but my education began after that. I started working with different scientists years later, and anyone who had information I wanted, I would go up and either knock on their door or give them a call. And I'd say, hey, I'm interested in this. Can you, you know, spare a few minutes to give me some directions to go? And I got some good mentors to point me in good directions. And it helped because I'm an avid reader, and I devour information quite readily, and I pick it up and I store it. But that's not my real gift. My real gift is in taking and connecting disparate data points into things that make sense and solve problems. And like you and many other people, uh, including the, uh, the manufacturer of the SE5, I get a lot of my data in the third sleep state in the morning where I get my downloads. And just like everybody else, you know, you get those things and you next day you're just so excited you put them to work so much of the information I got has come from all realms okay so when you're talking about how how all of this works and how you had access to these scientists how did you have access to those scientists if I heard about a subject I would go ask different people who do you know that's working on X and I'd get a name, I'd go look them up, and I'd make a phone call. There's a What's physicist that's in California who prefers to stay out of the limelight, and he's unbelievable at biogeometry. He also happens to be the fellow who I go to when I need monoatomic advice because he knows this stuff right down to the gnats you know what, and he's very big into the golden ratio, which we know now is the underpinning of a lot of our universe. 
Okay, but th- was this this was sort of something you did on your own, or something you did with the under the auspices of the the governmental agency that you worked for? I used the government agency I worked for as cachet to get in some doors, but all of this was orchestrated by me because when I got my orders um, with the group that I was part of, the Watcher Group, I was an unhandled operative. I had no handler. I was given what the task was, and I was allowed to interpret it any way I desired. And I did, and I still do. I'm still on the job, and I won't leave the job. So it's basically my planning and my execution of these things. And at times, I'll use the background as cachet to get in some doors. But most of the time, it's not necessary. Most scientists are anxious to work with somebody interested in their work. So all you have to do is voice an interest, and many of them will give you 5, 10, 15 minutes, 2, 3 hours, depending on what their schedule is like, on very interesting arcane subjects. Okay, well, that's very interesting. And and I think that some people will not know about this watcher group that you are part of. Do you want to talk about that? (laughs) That's funny. I don't know that much about them either. Um, I basically got called into a room. I was ushered in, actually. Um, I can't say where, um, but it was... At any rate, it was at a location that was a military installation. And I was ushered into a room with five or six or seven other guys. I don't remember how many. And they lined us up, and a group of military people uh, came up to us. They explained what was going on and how the military had been infiltrated in many countries and all the governments were infiltrated and they explained the difference between the white hats and the black hats and they said you have the choice of enlisting with us into this operation if you do it's a lifetime commitment if that's not good for you you can leave now and nothing will be said further and no permission okay um, we're going to go to a break and and I'll pick this up uh, when we return thank you Jeff Harp Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and I don't know, someone was just letting me know that it's really hard to find my radio show, and I guess that's not such a good thing. (laughs) Yeah, uh, Revolution has two studios and a fairly complex schedule here, and I guess if you don't notice that it's Eastern time, then you almost never find the show, so I guess I need to do something about that but just letting people know um, that I apologize that that's you know it's so hard to find I don't know why but anyway um, yeah Jeff so where we were was you were basically saying that you joined this group and you were given kind of a all or nothing <clears throat> uh, opportunity and you kind of had to either jump on board or not or, or walk away was right. there a Was there some indication to you ahead of time or during the time when you felt that you were in the presence of some people that meant what they said, that it wasn't a deceptive operation or any of that sort of thing? Okay. Yeah, I'm hearing a little uh, echo before. All right, it's gone now. No, there was zero doubt in my mind that I was dealing with a group of honest men. They outlined... Um, a lot of the things that were going on and they jived with some of the things that I felt when I was a younger lad so it wasn't difficult for me to feel that they were definitely telling the truth and the more that I learned over the years the more I realized just how deep I had gotten Um, if I had known how big it was um, I probably still would have done it however I would have went about it perhaps a different way uh, you would have gone about what a different way? Doing my job. I would have probably been far more aggressive, and I didn't because I didn't realize just the scope of it. I thought maybe there were a few bad eggs on the aircraft carrier eyes on, and that might be the extent plus you know whatever else is the couple of bad eggs in the other organizations. I had no idea the number of bad eggs in the carton far outnumbered the good eggs. 
Um, I found on board the ship a pedophile ring. I uncovered that and reported it to the officer who happened to be the mule for the drugs to bring on board the aircraft carrier. So that didn't work out so well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, did you, I, I mean, did you become persona non grata? At some point, I'm sure I did. Um, but the question is, is at what point, if there was a point, did they realize what my real job was? That's what really I'm interested in because, you know, I did a lot. I worked right in the intelligence center and I had access to the combat information center, the war room, a crypto, every single space above top secret, including the captain's bedroom. And my mics and cameras were everywhere. So at some point, you would have thought they would have figured it out. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, at that time, when exactly in relation to all of that that was going on, did you learn remote viewing? Okay, I didn't learn while I was in service. I learned when I got out. Um, after I had my little close scrape with death there in 2003, about 2005, I went to remote viewing training with Ed Dames, and that's where I met an ex-captain from the uh, the Army who has since then become an extremely close companion of mine and confidant and mentor. And um, he's similarly situated. I'll phrase it that way. Similarly situated to what? In the direction he and I are both headed. Oh. I, can't, I can't go into his background. That's not a good idea. But uh, okay. we're similarly situated as far as the direction we're heading. Okay. Uh, so this person taught you remote viewing? No, no. Ed Dames did. I see. Um, now, I had some dealings with Ed Dames myself. Uh, did you notice that there were some problems with the techniques you were being, being taught? <laughs> yeah. Um, the techniques were just fine. I learned remote viewing. It did well. It served me well. But it wasn't until after I got out of remote viewing training and I started looking around at the other remote viewing trainers and I ran into a book by Ingo Swan that was supposed to be fiction called Starfire. And something in that book rang to me like a bell. And that was the consciousness projection into inanimate partners. And once I attempted it, and I realized that that was not only possible, but it was just a standard state for human beings if you wanted to do it, I realized that a whole lot of things that I was taught were basically remote viewing light and I'm not denigrating what Ed taught because I think it is a good protocol to coordinate remote viewing. But I think if you want serious data and you want really rich data, I think that viewing through your astral eyes is far better. The hard part is that you have to be able to stay awake to do it properly. Okay. Uh, and... Are you familiar with David Morehouse? Yes, and that's some of the information I'm referring to. Okay, so so you you were able to I assume you read his book Psychic Warrior? Yes. Okay. Um and not I'm not the only one, but there are a group of people out he, there that as much as they try to sort of disinfo him and badmouth him feel that that's the best uh actually remote viewing I'm right. I agree with you 100%. I think when Ingo Swan developed these original techniques um, and he was able to do what he was able to do and David followed on and wrote that book, I think, I think what's going on is, and this is just a personal opinion, I think Ed was given an assignment. I don't think Ed left the intelligence community at all. I think he was given an assignment to bring out coordinate remote viewing as a red herring for the more powerful version of remote viewing. And he did a good job. It's uh, good stuff. It works well. And if you have David Morehouse's version in your head and you can do that, you get about <laughs> 10 times the data. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, you know, it's it's great to hear you say that. And um, I think offline we've already spoken about that, but I just wanted to sort of bring that out because it is interesting, uh, you know, and I don't want to raise, you know, get into any kind of big war here and, you know, whatever. Um, but it, it is quite interesting, kind of like, I don't know if you could do, if, if an, a good analogy might be talking to a musician, a musician, <laughs> um, who really knows their stuff and has innate talent as well and can let you in on some, like, s- hidden secrets in music that, um, sort of the masters know versus, I don't know, taking a college course or some, you know, standardized course in, in music theory. Something I, like that. I, and, and I don't see a war here. I really see that Ed has a phenomenal, uh, system of training that is a good starting point so that you understand the principles, the basics, and what happens. And then you go on to graduate studies with the real astral remote viewing. Well, that's very nice and very politic of you, but I do have to say that they have launched, and they did launch a long time ago, an incredible disinformation campaign and attack on, on, on David Morehouse, um, and that continues to this day, as a matter of fact. Um, so it wasn't without its um, sort of sharper side. Um, and in a certain sense, there's also been sort of an, uh, let's say, well, because it, it's it's sort of managed by the CIA behind the scenes, this is where they the controlled release of information keeps you in a sort of box so that you're manageable within what you learn, uh, actually figuring out that, people were going to learn it anyway, it was going to get out there. So if they could sort of limit and manage the uh, the use of it, you know, this is obviously you've kind of already said this in a way, but but, but I just want to reiterate that. Um, this is what goes on a lot. I mean, we get what you, what you said was sort of remote viewing light, but we get the light versions of many things and many um, people are sort of misled into thinking they have the whole deal when in fact they don't. That's exactly the reason why I'm doing the things I'm doing now. Um, you and I had a conversation offline that we should share with the, uh, the listeners. And it had to do with a problem I have with time and time travel. Um, no matter how I apply it or research it, it creates intense sadness in me. And I have no clue where that stuff comes from or why. And when I started using radionics to investigate that, it just opened the floodgates. It was ridiculous. I uh, I ran a program, and this was with my Rad 5, that as soon as I launched it, I was in tears for about four to six hours that day with no excuse why. No reason at all, no thought in my mind. I was just absolutely in tears all day. Couldn't figure it out. So when I started uh, activating my dealership for the SE5-1000 with Don Paris, who I think, by the way, he's listening, um, I realized that he has an advanced course that actually allows you to scan forward and backward in time. Now, most practitioners use it to find pre-birth trauma from conception to birth and clear that so that they can then work on the regular issues that a person might have. However, the ability in the advanced training to actually scan further back in time to past lives as well as forward affords an ability that I've never had at my fingertips like this before. So this is why I'm researching these things because not only can these things do practical things, but they can do things that will allow us to get hidden information that may answer some of those blank spots in my memory and maybe do the same thing for other people. So I want to make sure that I get as many of these out as I can to people that need them after I've tested it myself. So that's what I'm doing because I want to see this time component and find out why it's such an issue And I also want to use it to see if we can get some answers for ourselves about what's going on and how to move consciousness forward 
in the way that we can literally make some of the switches you and I both need know need to happen. Okay, well, when you're saying use this, what specifically are you referring to? Well, the SE5-1000 is a machine that is used to take codes to program holograms with, and their codes are basically the content of the information field of cells and substances like um, atomic elements and things like that, as well as nutrients, supplements, Bach flower remedies, homeopathics, anything. And so when I say this, I'm talking about that machine and the programs it has in it, which are, well, just literally SCADs. You can work on everything from acupuncture to emotions by changing the emotions through the information fields. You're not working on physical things. You're working on the actual information field to see if you can do matching and get results. And by using those programs, uh, there are many people, practitioners around the world using them now that are getting stunning results using this to cross time barriers to get answers and solve problems today, here, and now. Okay. Uh in your in your travels using this machine, I assume you've used it for your own investigation on a personal level, right? I am right now wearing an amulet that Jerry Avalos put together for me with one of the machines. And this particular one has um, codes that basically are very energetic. They're for vitality in the body and a lot of other things. And as you know, I've got vision problems. I have leaky capillaries, and from time to time I go blind completely. Now, what I have noticed is, is when I balance my field using this particular one, um, and Jerry and I have been consulting together about formulating an even better one, because I've got a lot of homeopathic and medical background as well as some science. Jerry is just tremendous in all sorts of realms, so we think by joining forces, we'll do a better job. But just so you know, the first time I put it on, I was about three quarters blind. And I put it on, and within a couple of hours, I was working on the computer again and typing and working on emails. And from time to time, if I go out in the garden and I do some spading or something where my head is low, I jam too much pressure up there, and the capillaries leak, and it just clears the vision right out and fogs it out. And normally that takes several days to a week or two to clear. Well, continuously wearing that, that same night, I was back on the computer again. So I'm finding that when you clear the information fields and you keep them balanced, what you find is, is you feel better. And, you know, many people have said that they have in interesting results similar to mine, and this is worldwide. There's about six providers out there, and these are big players, and it's a big, big universe. You know, it's several hundred million dollars a year in revenues, and we haven't even touched 2% of market penetration. So there's a lot of people that can be helped and learn about this, and I think everybody should know. So this is what I do. Okay. But when you say you use it to uh, clear... I guess, energy fields? Yeah, what you're doing is you first, um, let's take a look at this. You would actually use the device to measure certain things to see where it is, how well balanced you are in that information field. And so if you're off balance in an information field, what you do is, is you take and run a separate program that actually balances that particular information field which clears whatever the blockage is that was causing it to be that way. So that's okay, what we're talking let, about. Can we be more specific about if somebody has a blockage in an, in an area? Of All right. Say you have a meridian that's blocked, and you have chakras that are not working quite properly. So like any acupuncturist does, they stick a pin in or a needle into a spot, and they can either put it to sleep or they can activate it. And they'll do the one just before that to allow the energy to flow up to the one they're working on. And what we do is 
is we look at the information field around the cells at that actu- acupuncture point, and if that information field is corrupted somehow, you've got a blockage. So all we do is we simply run a balancing program to correct that information field blockage, and that information field then clears everything up, the channel flows, and off you go. That's the science okay. behind it. Right. But when you're doing this, are you engaging the the mind at all? In other words, is the person becoming aware of things they are not formally aware of through okay. the ideas of con- concepts and, and, and so on? Are they? Is this just a nonverbal process? All right. If you are working with someone, and let's say you're analyzing their information fields, and you explain to them what's happening all along the way, we all know that they can have a placebo effect, correct? So let's say you don't explain to them, and you just say, I'm going to do a balancing action for you. And you just simply do the analysis, and you balance them. And they go off, and all kinds of things change. And that's not a placebo reaction, because it lasts. Now, what we find, though, is sometimes people will go and reacquire issues, like you know, not doing something to solve the EMF coming out of their cell phone, which we have the ability to program holograms that you can use to reduce that EMF. And we have videos up on the web proving that with a field strength meter that we can reduce the EMF fields out of like a Galaxy PD um, uh, large uh, cell phone. And we can do that, and you can actually see the counter and hear the counter knocking down when we activate the hologram. And this has been going on for a very, very long time. Uh, this kind of technology has been around for between 10 and 20 years in one form or another. And it yes. just keeps advancing and advancing. Okay. Uh, all right. But in terms of kind of getting back to the the remote viewing, I'm, I'm trying to see how all of this kind of triangulates. And I guess you know that Scientology does some similar things, right? They do, but what they're doing is a whole different ball of wax. Um, The information field is something that can be cleared doing several different techniques. We just feel this is the most uh, effective there is, and it doesn't involve you telling all your weepy stories to your quote-unquote advisor and (laughs) having to pronounce you clear with a meter. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, all right. Well, fair enough. So, but at this moment, in terms of your own story and, 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 and time travel, I wonder, because it sounds like you're trying to use this to kind of recover memories or at least clear memories, which I'm not sure if it's valuable to clear a memory if you don't recover it first. Well, I don't want to clear any memories. I have no interest in clearing any memory anywhere, no matter how horrific. Right. I'm the kind of guy that likes to face all my problems. If I did something heinous, I need to face it, try and um, make amends for it if I can, and live with that result. Because I don't believe in burying things. That's compartmentalization, and that's the fastest way for you to manifest a physical illness is to stuff some heinous act in a bag, lock it in the back of your subconscious and say, oh, no, I didn't do that. I I, I can't find the bag, so I must not have done that. (laughs) Yes. Okay, so you don't want to clear the the sort of, well, I'm not going to say you don't want to clear the charge because on a certain level, when you recognize what it is you've done and you understand it, by default, you do clear. There is a sort of a clearing that happens. Not that you forget again. No, quite correct. But that, but that the you know what what they call charge is then removed, and so that it doesn't have any um, sort of ongoing effect on your be- future behavior, so to speak. That you're not Pavloving in relation to that particular hidden memory. I look at all of this as clearing of information field blockages 
so memory can flow freely and you can face whatever it is because when you're blocked how do you face it you don't sure okay um, well we'll thank you we'll be right back after this break and continue on this uh, track and then we'll also open up for questions this last, this last hour okay thanks Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio. Uh, okay, so Jeff, we were just leaving it off on more or less talking about time travel and radionics and using this sort of technique to access time, uh, past memories, and in a sense, we, ex- we experience time as memory, um, it seems to me. And, uh, and so if you're a time traveler, you have either future memories, in a sense, or past memories. And that's, and then you have a continuum and you sort of travel by going forward or backward along that trajectory and ex- re-experiencing or experiencing, um, sort of in a future way your, you know, whatever may happen. So have you been doing that? Have you been moving along a continuum? of memory I've been taking the traditional radionics unit I had uh, before the SE5 and what I do with that is it's a traditional device but it also has a very large orgone accumulator that's pulsed which makes it a generator and what I do is I write um, programs and when I say program I mean a cue similar to what you and I learned from remote viewing I structure a question or a statement. I tune it in using a stick pad response until my nervous system says that my mind and my nervous system got a lock on the information field that has to do with it, whether it be a future issue or a past issue, similar to what we do in remote viewing. And so I've written programs that allow me to move forwards and backwards in time subconsciously and then I attempt to link the unconscious mind to the conscious mind so that the results download, whether it be in the waking state or in the third dream state in the morning. So I use devices like that for that. What I want to use the SE5-1000 for is it's got programs already written and tested specifically for working forwards and backwards in time. Okay, have you gone forward in time? I have. I told you about one of those programs where I took and I I basically took a look at alternate timelines for myself that had successful timeline strategies. And I ran that so that it would bring them into this timeline and link them to my conscious and unconscious mind. Within two days... You contacted me to be on your show. Okay, sorry, I was muted right there. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I understand that, but but I I think that's you know and very interesting because some of us are more aware of ourselves as time travelers than others, and I I think that that even becoming aware of yourself as a time uh, as a time traveler is sort of half the battle, so that. When I did my time travel conference, um, it was great because people came together in one room to sort of experience the idea that we were all time travelers and therefore that we all had access to some of this, um, well, to memories uh, going forward and certainly going back. And that sort of... I, I think it, it, it jump-started the idea. Maybe well, that was a beautiful it, idea that you did. That event um, caused a linkage of the hearts, the minds, and subconscious and nervous systems of all those attendees, which basically took people who weren't that well linked into travel and helped them to come along with the rest of the crowd. I'm not at that level yet, but I've been able to consciously go back uh, during a clearance exercise and get some data there on past lives. What I'm looking for now is to go back even deeper and find answers as well as move forward 
and see if there's anything in the forward timeline that may be causing some kind of an information field blockage for me in this one. Okay, and, and actually I would say that there is the possibility that there might be one, not just for you personally, but across this sort of continuum or spectrum, maybe for many people. Um, now, you might have heard the time when Ed Dames and a lot of remote viewers were saying, oh, they couldn't see beyond 2012. Do you remember that? I remember it. I just don't believe it. Well, yeah, and it seems rather absurd when we, I mean, because we are now beyond 2012, and it doesn't seem so difficult to have seen this feature so far, although there does seem to be the possibility that, that certain things um, that could happen in the near future could be jarring in some way that then kind of um, puts a block or puts some kind of hurdle there so that what is happens isn't easily seen if you go back. I was and remote viewing my own death during the period they said you couldn't remote view past 2000. Okay, but you didn't die. That's my point. Okay. So if you remote view past 2000, why am I still alive? Right. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is really interesting. It's, it's um, what I would think is this kind of gets into this whole idea that of, of, the, of the frequency fence that the Anunnaki put in place from what I understand, around uh, 10,000 B.C., um, maybe a little earlier than that, and that then was actually removed, but because it was in place up to then, until it was actually taken down, which happened at around you know end of December 2012, from what I understand, and what I observed as well, um, you know, these people couldn't see beyond it. Now, if you look back, you look at it and you actually wonder why they couldn't see beyond it because it no longer has a frequency fence. Yeah, I just, I don't believe that's the case. I think we've always been able to remote view past 2012. I don't think there was a fence. That's my okay, personal you don't? Okay, yeah. well, but there was, uh, well, let me just say, because I mean, I remember very distinctly. Now, I know that that there are reasons why agencies would, for example, instruct Ed Dames or other people that are associated with the agencies to tell people that. Um, maybe, mind uh, virus. Sorry? A mind virus, yes. Well, yeah, okay, you can call it that. Um, or a mind control, um, you know, exactly. implant. But at the same time, there were others besides them that were also saying something similar. Um, now, perhaps they caught the virus, as you might say, or, you know, in other words, I think they call this a meme. Uh, or it could something. also be that some people do not have that kind of blockage, and others do. It may have to do with vibratory rate. Maybe it has something to do with your internal state. Well, let, for example, I had no problem prior to 2012 uh, dreaming the future beyond 2012. Right. Which is why I never had a problem thinking, you know, like what some people thought, end of the world type things. Because what end of the world type scenarios around that people were saying, in fact, Patrick Gerald, for example, and others who I'm going to not name here, um, who have been sort of doom and glooming it on a certain level, although I will listen and investigate their stories, I, I never brought them on board personally simply because... I have had dreams of the future going forward, you know, quite a ways. Um, now, that doesn't mean that those will come true, but it does sort of give one a more optimistic view that there was a potential for a future. 100% agreed. <laughs> so are you saying that you also were looking to the future and seeing beyond 2012? Oh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I wanted to look at and, you know, I, as I told you before, I like to face my fears. And so uh, I and Angel, who is now a member of uh, Ed's team, we remote viewed my death. 
And it was as it was supposed to be. I was alone in a cabin out in the woods, and there was an entity standing over me. I think that's a wonderful way to go. Well, okay, that that I'm sorry. Now you're losing me. What are you talking about? I mean, are you saying that well, I'm saying I remote viewed that before 2012? Since it didn't happen by 2012, it was pretty clear I was remote viewing past that. And when I was doing other operations. I'll phrase it that way. I saw several things happening here on Earth that whether or not they come to pass or not, I don't know. But it had a lot to do with aircraft that were not standard propulsion that were working with our military that basically were doing an occupation. And I saw this clear as a bell. And uh, I saw myself helping with the resistance side. So, you know, there was a lot of things I've seen forward, but I've also seen some interesting rosy stuff, too. But a lot of the stuff that I saw wasn't quite so rosy. And since it hasn't come to pass, it could just be a dream or it could have been a future dream. We don't know. Okay. Uh, but when you say you ha you saw your death and you had an entity standing over you, are you saying you still think that that's a pot potential future for you? Or are you saying that that didn't happen and so it won't? No, I'm I'm saying I certainly hope it does. I think it's a great way to go. Meaning, what do you mean by great way to go? Why? Because you think being killed by an entity is a good thing? I, I don't. I, I absolutely I don't. did not say I was killed by an entity. The entity was standing over me and watching over me as I passed on. Okay. I think uh, it was a very benevolent thing that was going on. And I'm by no means stating that all entities are uh, benevolent. But in this case, it was a very beautiful, peaceful scene. And, nice. you know, if I could pick a way to go, please get me up to the cabin. Okay, so so you, so you that's still um, in the offing as a possible future for you. It's in play. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, most people don't see their their deaths necessarily. Although I had what I call, well, I call it an ascension dream. And uh, although people may, I know there's some people that get really annoyed when I chip in here, but I'm going to do it anyway just because it may be edifying for some other people. And I'd also like to see whether or not you are sort of have envisioned anything of this sort in your own trajectory which is I saw myself driving off the Mulholland because I was talking on my cell phone, fooling around with it or something, and I saw my car going off the edge of a cliff, and instead of, and I said basically to myself, okay, that's it, I've really blown it this time, now I'm going to die, and instead of dying, I landed very softly in this wonderful, beautiful green field of you know, sort of rolling hills, and um, and I wasn't dead at all. <laughs> you had a very beautiful one, and yes, I've had almost an identical one to that. Really? Almost identical. Now, it wasn't Mulholland, <laughs> and no, I wasn't <laughs> screwing with my cell <laughs> phone. My car. I, I can see <laughs> you screwing with your cell phone, and, and off you go. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's okay though. But th yeah, I've I've had a couple of those and I'm I I know there's only a couple of ways I'll go. I'd prefer the entity way with an entity standing by, but since I was a child, I've had dreams of almost that identical dream, going off a cliff in a vehicle and um basically falling to the ground. There was one evening where I repeated that dream about 15 times. It was <laughs> It was a real pain in my backside, but uh, uh -huh. got me to the point where I no longer feared any of that, and I just relaxed into it. And many times after that, I would relax into it, and I would launch. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, so now we, we probably, I guess we should see if there are any questions in the chat. And um, let me see. Somebody's telling me to ignore... A certain question. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm just trying to scan through here and see if there are any questions that came into the chat. And I don't know if we have any callers, but if we do. Um, 
I guess someone wants to know how your protocol for RV is different than Ed Dames. All right. The protocol I set up was a combination of coordinate remote viewing, astral projection, and out-of-body projection. And when I say those three, what I'm saying is, is that what I would do is take myself down into theta state just before sleep, like I was going to do a regular remote viewing, coordinate remote viewing session. I would formulate a cue or a location in my mind of where I wanted to go. And what I would do then is I would wait for that familiar vibratory state to happen, and I would specifically will myself to launch out of body and then go to the location to view it. And the instance I'm talking about right now, I found myself about, oh, I don't know, 50 yards above a steel span bridge that was over a, a large valley um, and there was either a river or railroad tracks below, down below it. And off on the side, as I was looking and I was suspended in the air, there was a very large house on the side of the bottom of the valley. And there was a big town around it with a lot of trees. And so I simply moved with my mind down to the house, walked inside, took a look at the walls, look at the light switch, started walking up the stairs, and that was about when it ended. Had I had it to do all over again, I would have uh, moved my mind to the outside of the town where the sign was stating what the town was, and then I could have looked it up to see if it was this timeline, this reality, and see exactly where I was. The feel was a European village. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I, I don't see any specific um, questions other than that in the chat, so we're going to continue here, but I will put out the number. I guess the number to call in if you're interested in doing so is 424-253-0127, and I'll repeat that. 424 253 Zero one two seven. So, the other topic that we were going to touch on here was is holograms, and since you're sort of working in that area as well, do you want to talk about how holograms sort of mix into the rest of the work you do, and then how you're sort of marketing them, etc. Sure. Um, Basically, I'm putting together a set of website pages so that people have easy access to the data. And my website is jeftech.net. But I'd prefer that people call me at 570-219-2025. And that way we can chat a little bit to find out what they want to do before we do it. But what I use this for, and these holograms can be used for several things. Material sciences influence where you basically take the information field of metals, wood, rocks, whatever um, substance you want, and you can influence those fields, balance those fields, or simply measure those fields. Now, if you're going to measure them, it's easy. The SE5-1000 just does a measuring system, and it will auto-measure it or manual measure it, and you can get an idea of whether that information field is in balance or out. Um, that'd be great to try on the World Trade Center rubble if you could find any. The other thing is that when you're influencing a substance, you can literally take a second substance, whether it be another atomic element, um, deuterium, cobalt, um, radium, um, tin, lead, antimony, whatever, and you can actually apply that information field to the information field of another substance. So you're not, um, how should I say, doing substance work. You're doing information field exchange and manipulation to see what you can accomplish. And there's a lot that can be done with this. There's a recent story in the headlines about a freighter that split. I don't know if it's an accurate story or not, but it split and sank with arms aboard. And evidently the line was pretty sharp. Well, you could imagine if you could influence the information field on a piece of metal to act like the information field of, say, tin. So instead of steel, you would have 
the action of tin on the information field. There's a lot of things that could be applied to this. And then if you go into, let's say, wellness, you can use this system to actually work on the information field for your meridians, your chakras, your acupuncture points. You can work on the information field for various parts of the endocrine system and look at emotional balancing and things of that nature. So there's a lot in the wellness field that you can look at and measure as well as do some interesting experiments with. There are also some things you can do in other arenas like, um, as you know, pollution control has already been done. They're doing it in Europe. They're doing it in the U.S. in various labs where they take the elements or toxic elements that are in the uh, exhaust gases and they're destroying them before they ever hit the catalytic converter and the way that works is simple you simply identify what the toxins or the elements or heavy metals are you take a look at the information field and you run an inverse pattern you invert them so they actually cancel each other out and destroy each other before they even hit the catalytic converter voila low 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 emissions and perhaps you might even get a little better gas mileage who knows same thing with energy. You can influence the information fields around the electrons that are coming in the wires and cause them to do less or no damage to your system using the information fields. Now, this isn't for everybody because you're looking at just under 5,000 for a basic system with 17,000 codes, and you're looking at probably closer to 6,000 with everything you could possibly put in it, including advanced training to do the time travel work or the forward and backward scanning of time. So there's a lot that can be done with this. And what I plan to do is I'm going to work with Jerry. He'll be using his system. I'll be using mine. And we'll be working with some other practitioners to advance the state of the art of this forward. Even though we'll be competitors, we're going to be extraordinarily friendly we're going to share code, we're going to share algorithms, and we're going to see if we can advance this because there's just absolutely plenty of room for everybody to do this. But it's not for everybody because it is quite an investment to do this sort of work. Okay. Uh, to do that sort of, sort of work, maybe on the origination level, but, but actually selling the, the holograms themselves are very inexpensive, right? Yeah, they're not going to be expensive. We're looking at between, oh, between probably 35 and 100 bucks for the average one. Custom stuff is going to be a little bit over that. Um, I've heard stories of really big numbers being charged, and I just, I just don't see any need for it. I understand you have to get paid for your time doing analysis and balancing. But uh, Don has put together a new system that allows us to get a system and then have a whole bunch of balancing units that are attached to it. So after you analyze several people, you just assign each one of them a balancing unit, and you can balance them while they sleep at night. All you need is a bit of DNA to basically... Okay, we've got a break coming. Uh, we'll be right back with Jeff Harvey. Hi, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Jeff Harvey about time travel and holograms as well as radionics and a host of other things as well. Uh, Jeff, so right before the break, I, I think that you were finishing the answer to a question. Um, was there any last-minute remarks you wanted to say that you were kind of cut off? No, I think we caught it just at the end. Okay, um, so there is a question here in the chat, which is uh, has to do with um, how would you explain gravity? Ah, boy, that's a fun one. Uh, Michio Kaku has the exact opposite thought of it uh, that I do, and he's a great mind and an interesting fellow. But I believe gravity acts locally, and I don't think it's anything like what we've been told in school. Um, gravity may be more of a push thing instead of a pull thing. And there's a couple of theories out there that point to that. But um, I've seen some papers on it that have some merit. 
but it may actually be more of a push thing than a pull thing, similar to what we used to think was going on with lightning, where you would think it was a straight up and down thing going on, when in fact it was something along the you know parallel to Earth that was causing an action which charged that area in between. So it might have been a more of a dielectric effect. So it looks like gravity may actually not be um, quite as remote as we think. It may be a locally produced phenomenon, and it may actually be out of the ether. I don't know the answer. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah. There is another question here that has to do with, uh, do you think that they're going to use a false flag alien attack on Earth? I actually, you know, also known as Project Blue Beam. That's the, que the question. I have mixed thoughts on that, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, if some of the, what may be future uh, remote viewings I've done, have accuracy, then it may very well be that it's not going to be a false flag. We know that the military has alliances with factions that are off planet as well as those on planet. So it's entirely possible that it's no longer necessary for a false flag if they actually have the assistance of some of these groups. So I think that while it may have been planned, a la some of the information we got from one of the paperclip scientists, it may have been planned way back, I think it's entirely possible that it's gone way beyond that now. And if you look at us as the, the resource to be managed, that would make sense. Um, but if you look at the planet as the resource and we're simply the slave race to do the work to harvest resources, then depopulation and, of course, management of resources down to the nth degree would be necessary. And the only way that would ever happen is with some kind of an occupation. A false flag would not accomplish that. Okay, in other words, you're saying an actual occupation as opposed to a false one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, and I, I would suggest that in a sense the occupation has already taken place. I'm now it's they decide to have some bells and whistles in the future to kind of stimulate an us versus them scenario in the minds of, of people, that, that's another matter. And, and that's completely possible. Um, how widespread it would be, whether it would be concentrated to certain countries, even certain cities where they wanted to manage the population in a certain way to uh, possibly ca cause, you know, panic or submission uh, is another matter and, you know, and probably will be revealed as time goes on. Um, well, let's put the military hat on for a second because you made a comment that's interesting. If you're going to do a segmented approach to this, let's say you have a particular resource that's three miles down under, let's say, Bosnia or someplace like that, and this resource is extraordinarily uh, valuable. Let's say it's a new type of crystalline metal, and they want it because it's universally used around uh, the galaxy. So you want to segment that society. Well, your first step is, before you can do that, you have to do communications isolation. And that's something that has to be done on a very large scale if you're going to get away with it. Now, we've already seen that they've been able to do that in several areas um, on small scales. Um, one of the things they did in Chicago was practice some of the crowd and traffic control recently. Um, by basically courting off the whole city as a quote-unquote exercise. But in order to do this, you've got to silence communications globally between regions, and that's going to be a rough one because we have ham radios out there, we have CBs out there, and a CB, you know, the range might be 10 miles in daytime, but at night you can reach hundreds and sometimes thousands using tropospheric and ionospheric ducting, using the F2 layer when it drops around dusk. 
So chopping up communications is going to be tough. It would be more interesting uh, if I was doing something like this. I would say, okay, we've got an occupation already in place that they don't even know is happening. So now let's let's introduce an us versus them, and we'll use our occupational forces to enhance as uh, agents provoca- provocateurs the mindset of the masses to go along with it. And I think we're already seeing that. I think we saw it in Boston when they interviewed people in the streets saying, do you think it was a good thing? And you saw lots of people saying how proud they were of the response. You know, these are lemmings, basically. Uh, but, you know, you you got to admit, we're looking at an 80% population of met- lemmings out there. So the answer for you and I, and people like Don and others, and Jerry and Stephen, is to raise consciousness to such a point and a tipping point that it's no longer possible to have that effect on the rest of the population. And we can do that. And one of the reasons why Stephen is involved in this is he may be a key to the delivery system that actually does the final work for us. I can do broadcast delivery to whole populations in villages, but to do a larger broadcast um, if we're going to attempt to affect consciousness, may take a little more. Now, Don has worked on some really interesting scalar amplifiers, so he may have some answers for that too. But I think there's there's a lot more pieces left on this chessboard. Okay, and fair enough. And, and I'm actually working on a certain piece in that regard as myself. Uh, however, um, I, I think that that we are looking at a future in which they are planning to control a number of things. And I do also think that one of the things they do when they isolate a population, in spite of the Internet and in spite of the global sort of news that does travel around so and so forth, is they are able in a certain way to conduct an exercise in a place where because maybe because they surround it with disinfo after it happens. Yes. It's almost as if like Benghazi and various other incidents, even I, I think you could even cite Sandy Hook and, and, and Aurora, Colorado. And these things, in a sense, these are, I, they are exercises along their trajectory, but they're also um, tri- trials of yes. this sort of thing in which what they're what among other things what they seem to be testing is the idea that the truth can never be known because there are so many false leads yes. surrounding what actually happened but that's any good intel operation if you're doing a psyop you want to have an idea of what the majority of the population thinks and can be led to think then you want to find the influencers in the group see what their belief structures and systems are and then influence them with a separate set of actions or events. And then you want to take the lemmings in the population that literally can be swayed either way every single hour, and you simply guide them to the first group so that you have less management work to do. And it's not hard. Everybody who does any stage work at all does this every time they put on a play. There's no real difference between a play and these things. The difference is lives are lost. Right. Uh, but again, what, so what I was saying here with all of that is, is simply that, that that's what we're, what we're watching rolled out each time they have a so-called performance um, or an operation that, that takes place. And there are, will be more. I mean, in a sense, what we're teaching is not only to become aware but to have discernment. Because teaching how to break something down on your own when you don't have other people around to assist you in that process, you know, it is really vital because it could be the difference between life and death to you and your family under circumstances that where there's a lot of false leads, you know, being put out simultaneously um, to, to, you know, to, to gather the lemmings, as you call it. Yeah, and, you know, we've seen 
uh, evidence of what you just said about it being a life and death event, being able to discern what to do and what's really going on. You know, they were kicking down doors in Boston and going into homes to do the searches. In where I live, uh, in my neck of the woods, if they kick down a door, they wind up with a lot of weapons fire coming at them. And when you make a decision to do that, when somebody kicks down your door, you're making a decision that your life, it's okay to sacrifice to make a point. And many people out there have no interest in making a point like that. So my thought is we need to work on the consciousness raising so we don't ever get to that point. Even though they'll do a few of these operations, we might be able to get to the point where the people finally say, enough, we know their operations, knock it off. We're not going to play ball anymore. And when that happens, we have the tipping point achieved. And so part of what I'm working on and what I hope Jerry and I will come up with is some protocols that will allow us to get the understanding of these false flags and operations into the main masses so they no longer are looking at this as, oh, they're saving us. They'll realize it is what it is, an occupation. Right. And, and and that's very, very uh, valid. Um, one thing that I noticed, in, and let me say because I was at Stonehenge on the 21st of June, was the tremendous amount of police preparation for that event that drew some 20,000 people, upwards above 20,000, to this place, Stonehenge, on, on one day, one night, for um, well, it started in the morning and then went through to the next morning, really. But 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 at a certain point, people cleared out once the actual event had passed. Within I think three hours, they were planning to put everything back exactly as it was, and so it was it, it was run like um, clockwork, and there was a tremendous amount of forethought that went into sort of making everyone go down a certain road, ha- closing other roads, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, you know, sort of corralling the people to go a certain way. I mean, the British have been working on this kind of ways of thinking about things for a very long time. So they, they, have, they sort of are like a well-oiled machine, at least it seems that way when you're, when you're there. Um, it's quite strange, you know, to, to watch it all play out I have to say and 20,000 is is quite a substantial amount of people yeah and that kind of pre-management is extraordinary but that's what happens on battlefields and that's what happens now in our daily society it's as you know they've militarized all the police forces including the local hicks out in the middle of nowhere Um, They basically, when they go to anything where there's an armed anybody, they just shoot them, and that's it. Um, So it's it's getting interesting out there, and I'm hoping that we can move this forward in ways that we can avoid some of the bloodshed, but I don't think it's going to be possible to avoid it all. Yeah, interesting. Uh Interesting. Well, I can say that, I I don't know if this is completely accurate, but I was told that they even went so far recently as to making um, aggregations of people in Britain, 10 or more, um, without a license is considered a crime. I'm so surprised not. (laughs) Um, That's really over the top to me. Sorry? Uh They're starting to do things similar to that here in the United States. If you are a dissenter and you're in a group, um, you are in a whole different class, as you know. They have these um, free speech zones now where you're corralled off to a side away from the area you're trying to protest. And it's, it's getting to the point where it's almost the same thing here. And that's something that... Um, well, there are ways around it to solve that, but they're not as friendly as I would like to uh, practice. Okay, well, I, I can say that, that Bilderberg was also a perfect example of this type of thing because, again, we were in a 
in a corral surrounded by police, uh, overflown by helicopters and God knew, knows what el- else what they had set up there uh, for for problems, but uh-huh. um, at least a mile and a half from the actual site of of the building where supposedly the meeting was taking place. Although it's easy to to imagine that they simply entered the building and then went underground. So yeah. even if, if, if you know someone was able to per- penetrate their barricade, um, I'm sure that there were certain things in place. Um, along those lines, eventually they did. They were seen leaving in automobiles, but even now, of course, with the idea of clones and and all kinds of things that you can, you know, pretend to to, to be the real the real person, etc. So it it gets very weird, very weird, um, very fast. If you okay. go when I saw your broadcast, I was a little surprised that the distance for the quote unquote press group was so <laughs> far away. Um, oh yeah. It was almost like they should have just put up a signed dissenters group because that's really the way they were treating you. They were not giving you access like press would normally get. Not they were at all. That term to placate the crowd. Yeah, well, it and you know, th- their hope was that that having David Cameron say that they they wanted to have transparency and they set something up for the press did not equal uh, press access. Although I have to say, and I haven't had a chance to really talk about this yet, but there was a press person who, because I went the night before anyone else, uh, most anything else kind of was launched, um, and I was not supposed to be there then. And I, <laughs> I was taking them at their literal, literal word and trying to get in um, right. at, at the gate, which was actually very funny if you think about it basically um, challenging the emperor's new cult clothes. Um, but the other thing is that there was a, a press person who climbed out uh, from the bushes who had actually had a very long lens. And um, I think I won't describe him just in case he's fighting for the good guys. <laughs> right. But nonetheless, he, he came from inside the perimeter, let's say. Oh. And was escaping as I distracted the policeman, not on purpose, but just by <laughs> serendipity. Uh, he took that opportunity to sort of climb the fence really quickly and then go off down the road, and nobody was noticing him whatsoever except me. I tried to catch him on film, and actually I did get a couple frames with him in it. Um, <laughs> but, uh you know, so what that led me to believe is that actually some press was allowed in there, and I have I have a theory that there were some members of the press who have never gone public with what they learned or even the access they had, and that was part of the deal. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but it wouldn't have been him. Well, in theory, no, but uh, but on the other hand maybe something was going on with that because he having a long lens but not that long uh and 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 being having gotten in there he did he must have gotten something you know what i'm saying that's my but, point right but to our knowledge it's never made seen the light of day well there are members of my team that do that sort of infiltration all the time and those films are used for various operations. Um, there is one individual I know of who has been collecting images of the gray and black nobility just for certain operations to be performed. In the future, you mean? Yes, and currently. Uh-huh. Okay, fair enough. Uh Last, okay, we're running out of time very quickly here. And um, just out of curiosity, this group that sort of, for lack of a better word, recruited you, if you want, do they are they in contact with you on a regular basis? Not that I know of ever. I've found oh. myself getting invited to certain places and being told to go here and go there by people saying, oh, you'd, you'd want to go over here and do this. And... You know, have ever identified themselves as one of the group. Never. As far as I know, I have never uh, spoken to another one of them since that day back in 76. Yes. 
Okay. Well, so I could, doesn't, it, it doesn't help. <coughs> it's not useful if I ask you if I can interview one of them because <laughs> you're not in touch with them. Look, so. if it was one of them, um, I would, I would certainly help enable that to happen. The only person that would be of value to interview, um, well, there's two people that would be of value. Walter Bosley, and he's not a member of that group. And the other would be the ex-army captain. And the ex-army captain, the value in uh, interviewing him is, at the tip of his tongue, he has almost the entire hierarchy structure. Um, he literally can rattle this off in minutes. Who's connected to who? Who reports to who? What house they belong to? Who controls what house? You know, you know why the break spears are controlling, you know, the House of Orange and all that stuff. Um, he would be extraordinarily good for that. But you will never, ever see his face. And I'm not sure I want to see his voice out there anywhere either because it's extraordinarily distinctive. Hmm. Okay, interesting. All right. Well, uh, you, you know, there are a, num a number of a very positive people out there sort of fighting the good fight, and um, and we're glad they are. Uh, so at any rate, you want to give your, uh, I guess, your website and anything else you'd, you'd like to say as last words to, to the public sure. at this juncture as we're just about to end the, sh the show. All right. Anybody who's interested in some of the wellness work I do, I have extraordinarily strong sporebiotics, and I have spiruzan tablets that are extremely good. And we're going to be taking those and loading those information fields into holographic cards, as well as some of the other formulations we have. You can go to my site. It's www.jeftech.net. Um, and right there on the front, it'll tell you about the, uh, the Spiruzan and over in the Nutriture section, you can find it. And I made it very affordable for everybody. If you want to discuss the SE5-1000 and things of that nature, do not email me. Call me. My number is 570-219-2025. And uh, we'll see what we can do to arrange a slight discount for being on the Project Camelot show. All right. Fair enough. That's great. Okay, Jeff, uh, thank you so much again for coming on the show. And uh, I think that it would be great to have you back again because there's still more things I want to talk about with you. Uh, and, and I think that everyone has been very, very interested to hear what you have to say. And it's great that you're going down all these different roads. And um, so let's talk some more in the future. My pleasure, and I appreciate everything you've been doing because I've been going through your archives, and they are absolute gold. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. All right, and everyone, uh, thank you for listening, and have a great weekend. Good night, everybody.